It is uh, an enormous honor to present the uh, B. Kenneth Simon lecture and to be back here at Cato, uh, which I consider to be my philosophical home. It's always nostalgic to come back to this magnificent city in which I spent uh, 16 years. Uh, and nostalgia comes in all sorts of ways. In fact, I was walking here from Starbucks and just filled me with nostalgia to see a meter maid giving tickets uh, in the parking <laughs> car. And I thought, to, I had not really thought of that since leaving Washington, D.C. That is the most efficient government service in the history of the world. <laughs> if I were president, I would name the head of that agency to run everything in the United States government. When I uh, lived here, I used to tell friends from out of town, if you ever are a victim of crime, try to be a victim of crime near an expired parking meter because <laughs> the response time is so much faster than if you're like murdered or something like that. But uh, it's great to be back. You know you're getting old when um, you come and lecture uh, in this new auditorium, remembering that you also lectured in the old auditorium, but also that you delivered a lecture in the courtyard of the townhouse uh, across from the Capitol uh, South Metro Station, um, which was just a delightful uh, setting. But I have to say I am so proud of the Cato Institute and of Roger and Ilya and all of the leadership of this fine organization for, for this splendid auditorium and the building and everything that you've been able to accomplish. Over the last 30 years, and that's how far back our relationship goes, Cato has been my teacher, my partner, my softball nemesis, <laughs> and my publisher. And the, the book that uh, Roger mentioned in, uh, in particular is salient, David's Hammer, The Case for an Activist Judiciary. We were recounting that we were verbally wrestling over whether that should be the subtitle for that book, and I argued that we should recapture the term judicial activism, that even though it's become almost a universal pejorative, that in reality it's very important if you define judicial activism as striking down unconstitutional laws, then the problem with judicial activism is not that we have too much of it, but far too little. And so uh, uh, Roger finally agreed that we would have this. And that is a totally fine subtitle to have for your book if you have zero aspiration of ever serving in the judiciary. Um, at that time, I had zero aspiration of serving in the judiciary, so it was fine. But this book became controversial uh, when I decided about uh, a year ago to apply for a vacancy on, on the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, especially with our, our new Governor Ducey, I thought perhaps I had a chance to, uh, to serve on the court. And our selection system in Arizona is a, a, a merit selection system. So you have to go through a commission uh, twice, and then uh, you hope to be one of the names that's sent to the governor. And one of the questions on the application is, uh, have you ever published anything? If so, please list everything. <laughs> And for, I'm astonished at the number of lawyers who have been you know, working in the law for like 30 years who list zero things. Or they'll list a law review article or you know, an article on, on uh, foreclosure of mortgages for you know, Arizona attorney. I look at that question and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got hundreds of articles. And so um, my research assistant uh, endeavored to find them all. And uh, they, they really were, it was quite a long list. And she also made me feel very old when she said, you know, you published a lot of these before I was even born. <laughs> um, nonetheless, the one thing that stuck out on that list, despite all sorts of provocative other articles, was David's Hammer, the case for an activist judiciary. Will a conservative governor appoint someone to the Arizona Supreme Court who is actually in favor of an activist judiciary, and it, it, it brought to, my, to mind those of you who were 
uh, here for the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings, the first half of them were dominated by Joe Biden waving around Richard Epstein's book, Taking, like, have you, are you now, or have you ever been a supporter of the radical ideas in this book? But it turned out to be a teaching moment, uh, and it was absolutely delightful, both before the commission and then in my subsequent interview with Governor Ducey, because a lot of people had really never thought of the proper role of the judiciary and that there can actually be something called positive judicial activism. And the question did come up on multiple occasions and it was addressed to the other applicants as well, which I thought was really great because that is something that people ought to think about before they become judges. So uh, it turned out well uh, and in fact this January, I uh, received a call from Governor Ducey to offer me the, the appointment to the Supreme Court. And um, any of you know, who know me know that this is uh, not made up at all. Uh, when the call came in, I saw it was on the phone and I accidentally disconnected the, gov <laughs> the governor's call. And fortunately, he was still there when I, when I called back. Um, you know, I, I said that it was unintentional, but I've subsequently realized that it was uh, kind of an implicit uh, statement of my view of the proper separation of powers. Um, but he did uh, accept the phone call and uh, he offered me the position I was enormously grateful to accept. And toward the end of the conversation, he said, there's just one thing I'd like to ask of you. And I thought to myself, oh no, what is this quid pro quo that he's going to ask? And he said, and I'll never forget these words, he said, I would like you to continue writing and speaking as much as you possibly can. And that to me is a, is a promise that I was uh, able to make and I'm happy to be able to keep it here at the Cato Institute uh, and in this incredibly uh, significant lecture series. Today we celebrate, two days prematurely, the 229th anniversary of the signing of the most magnificent national freedom charter ever created. And we do so appropriately enough in an institution dedicated to the eternal perseverance of the Constitution and the principles on which it is based. And yet when we speak of the Constitution, no matter how much we properly revere it, we often overstate its intended importance in the American rule of law. For in our federal system, we have not one constitution, but 51 constitutions. It is part of the masterpiece of federalism that each of us in the 50 states can look for the protection of our rights, not to one constitution, but to two. And in that regard, state constitutions were intended to be primary, not secondary. Indeed, the national constitution drew greatly from state constitutions, particularly in identifying individual rights that would be protected against the national government. It was not until the 14th Amendment that individuals could look to the national constitution to protect them against deprivations of freedom visited upon them by their own state or local governments. Even then, many important individual rights were protected either by state constitutions or not at all. And yet today, state constitutions are relegated to afterthought. Constitutional law classes rarely mention them. Litigators rarely invoke them. State courts often interpret them as if they were mere appendages of the United States Constitution. And ironically, despite their professed commitment to federalism, conservative and libertarian litigation groups have focused almost exclusively on the national constitution to the exclusion of state constitutions, except when they have no other choice. That emphasis is profoundly unfortunate for two reasons. First, it overlooks the vast untapped potential of state constitutions as bulwarks for freedom. Second, it constitutes resources, it concentrates resources and judicial terrain that likely will produce diminishing returns for freedom in the years to come. So even as we pause to celebrate the remarkable resiliency of our nation's constitutional charter, 
so should we look anew to state constitutions that were intended to provide the first line of defense against overreaching government. For freedom advocates, state constitutions provide significant advantages over their national counterpart. Indeed, if this talk had a subtitle, if it would be, if only, as in, if only the United States Constitution contained these features. Although the national constitution has many nifty qualities from a freedom perspective, many of which have unfortunately been winnowed away by federal courts, they pale in comparison with state constitutions. I call these superior features of state constitutions the fabulous five. Foremost among them is that all state constitutions provide protections of individual rights and constraints against government power that are completely unknown to the US Constitution. I will discuss some of those provisions later on, but among those that are common to many state constitutions are explicit rights to privacy, debt limits, and prohibitions against gifts of public funds. For freedom advocates, exploring state constitutions is like being a kid in a candy store. But, unlike, or, but like the proverbial unseen tree falling silently in the forest, the freedom provisions of state constitutions are equally silent when they are unlitigated. Second, many freedom provisions that are similar to provisions in the US Constitution are written more broadly. And even when such provisions are identical to the US Constitution, state courts are free to interpret them differently than the federal courts do, but only in one direction. State courts may apply state constitutional provisions as more protective of freedom than the federal courts protect similar provisions in the US Constitution, but not less. I call this the freedom ratchet. The US Constitution provides the floor beneath individual rights, while state constitutions can provide greater, but not lesser, protection. Third, state courts have the final word on state constitutional interpretation. In other words, if you prevail on a state constitutional issue, the, the other side has no recourse to the US Supreme Court, unless, of course, the state constitution itself violates the national constitution. That is reason enough for freedom advocates to always consider filing constitutional cases in state courts and to always assert independent state constitutional grounds when doing so. Fourth, state constitutions often provide greater access to the courts than does the national constitution, at least as interpreted by the US Supreme Court. For instance, many state constitutions do not contain case or controversy requirements. Perhaps most important, unlike federal courts, most state courts recognize taxpayer standing to challenge unconstitutional spending. Finally, state constitutions often are far more easily amended than the national constitution. I see my friend Manny Klausner out there who could attest uh, the California constitution has been amended a few times. Um, if you've ever aspired to constitutional authorship, I suggest you look at amending state constitutions rather than attempting the Sisyphean task of amending the US constitution. Arizonans have added numerous freedom provisions to our constitution in recent years, including a prohibition against racial preferences in government employment, contracting, and education, the rights to healthcare autonomy and of terminally ill patients to use experimental drugs, and a provision authorizing the legislature or the people to forbid the use of state funds to implement federal laws or programs they believe exceed constitutional boundaries. We call that one the federalism shield. State constitutions, like the national constitution, were intended to protect individual rights and restrain government power. Their potential to do so is vast and largely unrealized, yet hardly unrealizable. The earliest clarion call for freedom advocates to recourse to state constitutions came not from the right, but from the left. In a pair of penetrating law review articles by US Supreme Court Justice William Brennan, 
Justice Brennan was not only a highly effective jurist, but a brilliant legal strategist. By 1977, after he had served on the court for 21 years, the Warren Court with Brennan as its chief architect had experienced a very successful run, fundamentally reshaping American jurisprudence in a wide array of areas, most notably the rights of criminal defendants. But Brennan correctly sensed that change was coming. With President Nixon's appointment to the court of so-called law and order strict constructionists, the jurisprudential tide was turning. Writing in the Harvard Law Review, Brennan declared that, quote, the legal revolution which has brought federal law to the fore must not be allowed to inhibit the independent protective force of state law. For without it, the full realization of our liberties cannot be guaranteed. Where federal courts retreated from judicial frontiers, Brennan urged liberal advocates to turn instead to state courts. They did, and with gusto. Only nine years later, when Brennan wrote his second article on the subject, he could report at least 250 state court decisions that had, cons that had construed their constitutional rights more broadly than their federal counterparts. Most of the decisions were in the realm of criminal procedure, but others encompassed free speech guarantees, educational equity, and the like. In this second article, Brennan's call to arms was even more urgent, and he drew, addressed that call to both liberals and conservatives. He applauded state courts for construing state constitutional counterparts of provisions of the Bill of Rights as guaranteeing citizens of their own states even more protection than the provis federal provisions, even those identically phrased. Brennan declared, and I quote, every believer in our concept of federalism, and I am a devout believer, must salute this development in our state courts. Fast forward 30 years to today. I submit that conservatives and libertarians may well find ourselves in a Brennan moment. For the past quarter century since the confirmation of Justice Clarence Thomas in 1991, we have enjoyed a renaissance in the jurisprudence of original meaning. This organization has had a huge part in fueling that renaissance. I know that many will argue whether the class is half empty or half full, and all of us would quibble over doctrinal details, but few of us would trade the federal jurisprudence of 2016 for that of 1991. We have made significant progress for liberty in areas as diverse as freedom of speech, religion and association, private property rights, Second Amendment rights, racial classifications, school choice, and the limits of, of federal power under the Commerce Clause. Yet as Justice Brennan understood, presidential elections have consequences, none more pervasive and enduring as the power to influence judicial selections. Regardless of the outcome of this year's presidential election, the odds that Justice Antonin Scalia's successor will be as militantly committed to textualism are close to zero. And given the propensity of five to four votes on many of the great constitutional issues of the day, we may well see sharp reversals in the progress of the last 25 years. So the time has come for freedom advocates to devote greater attention to state constitutions. Some of the issues on which we have experienced great success in the federal courts cannot, of course, be equally advanced in state courts. But many, such as freedom of speech and religion, private property rights, and equal protection can be. And as I noted earlier, largely unexplored state constitutional frontiers abound in other areas, including economic liberty, relating to the question from the previous uh, session, and taxpayer protections. Brennan's epiphany over the independent vitality of state constitutions is as relevant and resonant for today's freedom advocates as it was nearly four decades ago. My own epiphany about state constitutions occurred early in my career. Like most lawyers, I never took a course in state constitutional law and hadn't a clue about what treasures those mysterious documents contained. But I was about to be schooled on them by, of all entities, the teachers' union, in what was to be the most important case of my young career. 
I went to law school in large part to advance educational freedom, especially through school vouchers, and was determined to defend voucher programs against inevitable legal challenges by those invested in the, in, in the status quo. Trouble was, there were no voucher programs to defend. That changed in 1990 with the enactment of the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. Initially, it was a tiny program limited to 1% of the school district students who could use a fraction of their education funds as full payment of tuition in non-sectarian private schools. Well, we had been preparing for years for an attack of voucher programs under the Establishment Clause, but this didn't raise Establishment Clause issues because religious schools were not included. So the uh, challengers had to look not to the US Constitution, but to the Wisconsin contribution, uh, Constitution for their line of attack. And we wondered, what would they be? We finally found out. Under the Wisconsin Constitution, they found three causes of action, the Educational Uniformity Clause, the so-called public purpose doctrine, and the private or local bill clause, which the challengers asserted the program violated because it was passed as part of the state budget rather than as a standalone bill. I had never heard of any of those provisions, and I had all of a couple of weeks to fathom and argue them. For the next two years, we battled over those provisions, winning in the trial court, losing in the court of appeals. The private or local bill clause in particular became the bane of my existence. Ultimately, in 1992, we prevailed in the Wisconsin Supreme Court by the resounding vote of four to three, which marked the start of a vibrant movement, national movement to expand educational opportunities to children who desperately needed them. But over the course of that grueling struggle, an odd thing happened. I fell in love with my bet noir, the private or local bill clause. Once I allowed myself to get past my adversarial disdain and see it in its natural splendor, I found the stuff of which libertarian dreams are made. A constitutional provision aimed at one of the most odious yet ubiquitous legislative practices, log rolling. Properly applied, the local or private bill clause contained in numerous state constitutions requires narrow interest bills to stand on their own and be voted upon separately in the light of day. No more bridges to nowhere. No more larded up appropriations bills. No more earmarks. If only the US Constitution contained such a provision. Having grasped the potential of the private or local bill clause, I made a mental vow to one day use it to good effect in litigation, a promise my colleagues and I eventually kept. But that was not for many years. A far more pressing issue emerged that required recourse to state constitutional provisions with uh, results that illustrate perhaps better than any other the importance and potential for state constitutional guarantees. That issue was eminent domain. Under the guise of economic development, local governments around the country were using eminent domain in reverse Robin Hood fashion to take property from its owners and give it to others. The Fifth Amendment, of course, prohibits that practice, limiting eminent domain to public use. But a body of thought that sometimes dominates the US Supreme Court holds that the Constitution is self-amending and that the justice's role is to discover and announce when that happens. Sure enough, the court discovered that the limitation of the Fifth Amendment had transmuted from public use to the far more forgiving public benefit. So that when my colleagues challenged the taking of Suzette Kilo's little pink house in New London, Connecticut, under the Fifth Amendment, they faced a decidedly uphill task. And we all know the outcome. The neighborhood was bulldozed, the supposed public benefit never materialized, and we all suffered an erosion of our precious liberties. But at the same time the fight against eminent domain was being fought and lost in federal courts, my former colleagues and I were waging a similar battle in Arizona state courts on behalf of Randy Bailey, who owned Bailey's Brake Service in Mesa. 
Randy inherited the business from his dad and wanted to pass it along to his son. But the city of Mesa had other ideas. It wanted to take Randy's shop and several homes to give to the owner of a hardware store who wanted to expand. Under the Kelo decision, Randy surely would have come away empty-handed in federal court. But in state court, Randy had a powerful weapon, Article 2, Section 17 of the Arizona Constitution. That provision states, and I love reading this, it's just so amazing to me that this language exists in a constitution, private property shall not be taken for private use. But not only that, it goes on to say, whenever an attempt is made to take private property for a use alleged to be public, the question whether the contemplated use be really public shall be a judicial question and determined as such without regard to any legislative assertion that the use is public. This language is over 100 years old. These guys knew what was coming. And they were bound and determined that it would not happen. And sure enough, although the courts previously had not vigorously applied that standard, in Randy's case, they did. So that you will never, while you will never be able to go and enjoy an evening at Suzette's little pink house, if your brakes fail in the city of Mesa, just head to the corner of Country Club and Maine, and you can get your brakes fixed at Bailey's Brake Service. That decision, in my view, exemplifies what federalism and state constitutionalism are all about, and it can be contagious. Indeed, several other state courts have also applied their eminent domain provisions more broadly than the US Supreme Court to protect private property rights. Other state court decisions have expanded the boundaries for freedom in other areas. In Arizona, my former colleagues and I at the Goldwater Institute dusted off the gift clause of the Constitution, which forbids gifts of public funds to private individuals, corporations, or associations. At the time, Arizona cities were competing for sales tax revenues by giving subsidies to retail shopping centers. A Chicago developer landed a nearly $100 million subsidy to construct a Phoenix shopping mall that was supposed to be so grandiose that my colleagues and I took to calling it the Taj Mahal. In its 2010 decision in Turkin versus Gordon, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled that payments to private companies are unconstitutional unless supported by tangible and forcible consideration, thus bringing the costly subsidy wars to an end. Dozens of other states have gift clauses in their constitutions as well, which are rarely deployed despite a plethora of government subsidies. A recent decision by the Texas Supreme Court has special meaning because it involves a right to which I devoted a large part of my litigation career, but one that the federal courts have almost completely buried, freedom of enterprise. Even though economic liberty was meant to be a foundational freedom protected by the 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause, federal courts have abdicated their responsibility to protect it, no matter how sweeping, destructive, or protectionist the regulation. In Patel versus Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, the Texas Supreme Court independently interpreted the state constitution to require greater justification for professional licensing, striking down regulations on eyebrow threading. In a concurring opinion, my friend Justice Don Willett articulated perfectly the necessity of state constitutionalism, and I quote, today's case arises under the Texas Constitution over which we have final interpretive authority, and nothing in its 60,000 plus words requires judges to turn a blind eye to transparent rent seeking. How often do you read rent seeking in a judicial opinion? Not enough. That bends government power to private gain, thus robbing people of their innate right, antecedent to government, to earn an honest living. Indeed, even if the Texas due course of law perfectly mirrored the federal due process clause, that in no way binds Texas courts to cut and paste federal rational basis jurisprudence 
that long postdates enactment of our own constitutional provision, one more inclined to freedom. Those stirring words are both an exposition of the boundless realm of the possible, as well as a call to action. So what are the frontiers for freedom advocacy under state constitutions? They depend, of course, on the particulars of, of specific state constitutions and the opportunities they afford to protect freedom. They also depend on how much erosion our rights sustain under the federal constitution and whether state constitutions can fill the void. One area in particular I believe holds special promise, freedom of speech. All state constitutions embody free speech protections. Many are worded differently than the First Amendment and all can be interpreted more broadly. Despite the First Amendment's categorical prohibition against abridging freedom of, fee of speech, federal courts, of course, apply different scrutiny to regulations of different types of speech, such as commercial speech. State courts need not necessarily follow that lead in interpreting their own state provisions. For instance, should commercial speech be relegated to less protected status under state constitutions? Should the United States Supreme Court overturn Citizens United, might state constitutions shield corporate speech in the political context? Might the cause of Rebecca Friedrichs, whose fight against mandatory public employee union dues stalled in a split vote in the US Supreme Court, be gainfully pursued under state constitutions? We cannot know the answers to those questions unless and until such cases are brought. So far, I have emphasized the role of freedom advocates in bringing state constitutional actions. I will conclude my remarks by briefly discussing the role of judges in that context, a subject to which I hope to return in greater depth soon. Judges are or ought to be bound by the rule of law. Even in my short time on the Arizona Supreme Court, I can attest that taking the rule of law seriously often means departing from personal policy preferences. We are not policymakers. That role is played by the political branches within their constitutional boundaries. But as state court judges, we swear an oath to two constitutions, and we ought to take each oath seriously. When a state constitutional issue is presented to us, that oath, in my view, requires us to interpret what the words of our constitution mean, not what federal courts have interpreted national constitutional provisions to mean. Unless our state constitutional provisions derive from the national constitution, what federal courts have to say about similar provisions of the national constitution mean is largely irrelevant to our task. In particular, even when federal courts have determined that provisions of the US Constitution have evolved, that is to say, they have amended themselves to permit greater government power or protect fewer individual rights, there is no reason to assume that similar state constitutional provisions have experienced similar regressive metamorphosis. Each state developed its organic law to reflect its own values and aspirations. A state constitution's meaning often is evident from its text and history, but rarely from reference to federal jurisprudence. That is what is meant by independent interpretation of state law. As state judges, we are oath bound to determine what our state constitutions mean, and quite often, they mean to protect freedom. As a justice, I draw inspiration and take my marching orders from Article 2, Section 1 of our Constitution. And I quote, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is essential to the security of individual rights and to the perpetuity of free government. If we take those words seriously, we will, despite all odds, leave to our children and grandchildren a nation more free than we inherited. 